Hi, I'm John Moolis and welcome to the last of my videos about the bullying and harassment that I received at the Department of Finance 1977 to 1986. Now, we're at February 1986 now and I've submitted my resignation. By this stage I'd been suspended for four months on full pay. I was had a new life, I was new meaning in my life. I, I from the very first day, the very first day of suspension, you know, I woke up in the morning, you know, I, I, I got out of bed straight away. I didn't lie in bed for 10, 15 minutes staring at the ceiling, dreading not wanting to get out of bed because I just didn't want to go back to that place again. You know, I got out of bed, I had a leisurely breakfast, I watched the Today Show on the TV, I went down to the shops and bought the newspapers and read them and and I, I went there and started back in the gym again working out and I started swimming, doing laps each day and, and all, all of these new things and a couple of days later I shaved off my my beard and I cut my hair short again and 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 I remember I looked in the the mirror and I said you know welcome back you know I I I got over that dreadful image that I was trying to cultivate of the the Vietnam vet bush hermit with the long hair and the beard and the 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 camouflage clothes and all that sort of thing I mean mind you I still bought Soldier of Fortune magazine and, and that sort of thing for about a year after that. But, you know, I, I progressed past that and and I, I had a new life and I was going down to Canbar Pool Reserve and getting my gear off and in the sun and everything and, and meeting up with people down there and, and, you know, people that I'd known and everything. Oh, look, I mean, the... It was a huge burden had been taken off my shoulders when I was suspended. And I knew it from the very first day. And as each day and each month and each week and each month went past on suspension, you know, finance was getting further and further back in the rear vision mirror. I was moving away from it, moving on. And, you know, the idea that I, I would actually go back in there and sub subject myself to all that again, that psychological torture or psychological terrorism it was, and, and, and the bullying and the complaints and all, and that, that just that devastating feeling of just worthlessness of, and all that. You know, to think that, that I, you know, I'd go through with the appeal and, and probably win it and have to go back there again. Oh, look, it was a no-brainer. So, and there was another thing too, is I already told you that I met somebody from the Promotions Appeal Committee during that period, and, and he told me that nearly every appeal against a dismissal was upheld, you know, and, and I asked him what happens then, he said, well, you go back into your old job, you go back to the old department in your old job, and, and I said to him, I said, look, is there any provision for being redeployed to another department? You know, because, you know, there's very bad blood there that, you know, a lot of hate and resentment was there and that toxic atmosphere. You know, and, and the other thing too is that, that um, Galloway would have been absolutely ropeable. You know, all he wanted was for, for to get me out of the department and he almost succeeded there only to have it overturned by a bunch of pesky outsiders. He would have been absolutely ropeable. I mean, you know, I, and I said to I said to this guy from the PAC, I said, you know, is, does the PAC have any any judiciary or tribunal, any methods of dealing with any repercussions that might come out of going back into your old job? And he said, no. He said, our our involvement stops when when the appeal is is done. You know, that's the end of our involvement. And I thought, well. I thought, stuff that, you know, and, and having to wind back the clock eight years back to the, the day I left school when I was a teenager doing exactly the same job I was doing back then, pressing a button on a photocopier, you know, when all these other doors had opened for me, 
I mean, uh, get real, I, I couldn't do that. And like I said, all these other doors had opened for me. The photography I wanted to study, journalism I wanted to study. You could do all of that with a communications course at Canberra University or CCAE. I, I already told you that I couldn't go to Northern Rivers College because I missed out on the student residence ballot. And, um, you know, and I'd get a degree in that and then I'd, I was going to do a postgraduate course in sports science and sports medicine and nutrition after that. You know, and to get careers in those fields, you know, and, and to slam all of those doors shut and go back into finance again in that toxic environment, I just couldn't do it. So I told you, you know, I went and put in my resignation. And, and the other thing too is that time was, was ticking on. I mean, the new year had started. The new academic year was about to begin. And there was a cutoff date to apply for student allowance or tease as they called it back then. I think it was 20th of February and and the academic year started, I think, the last week of February or the first week of March. And so I really had to move quickly because you couldn't apply for student allowance when you were still employed, still on the payroll. So I put in my resignation for um, February the 16th, I think it was. And on that day, you know, I went to to the Department of Finance to pick up my stuff. I went to the security desk and they phoned up Galloway's receptionist and she came down, signed me in, bundled me up there to um, the, the print room. You know, I went in the print room and, and Jim Tuckerman, the OIC, had taken down all my posters and put them in a tube and and had taken all of my papers out of the filing cabinet, put it all in a box, ready for me. And I said to Jim Tuckerman, I said, you know, I suppose you, you'll be organising a farewell for me at East Lake Footy Club, because um, Jim Tuckerman was an official with the East Lake Footy Club, which was near finance, an Aussie rules club, and that's where all of the farewells for all of the staff were held. And he said to me, he said, no. He said, he said, you can organise a farewell yourself at your place if you want, but nobody will turn up. I thought, you know, wow, that's the farewell I get. And then um, at that same time, the door opened of the print room and Galloway's receptionist came in and said, you have to be out of the building now. Galloway says you have to be out now. And I said, and I said to her, I said, look, I've been here for eight years. I mean, I want to say goodbye to a few people because there were a few people at finance who I liked, who I got along with. I used to send them postcards from my holidays and that. And, and she said, no, she said, you have to be out of the building now. Come with me. And so I had to go with her. And along the corridor on the way was registry, the counter at registry. And so I ducked into the counter at registry and she said, no, not enough time. You have to get out now. And... and I said to the staff at registry, I said, parting is such sweet sorrow. And so, you know, I was bundled, bundled out of the building, past the security guard, and out the front door of, of uh, Treasury Building for the last time. And that was it. You know, and it was reasonable to expect that that, that, that would be it, that, that Galloway had achieved his aim, he'd forced me to resign. And uh, I was out of the department, out of his hair, no longer a problem. But Galloway just wouldn't let go. Over the next few years, he, he kept on doing these things to try and get back at me. I mean, uh, uh, the first thing that happened was my superannuation payout. I mean, uh, a couple of weeks went by. It hadn't, wasn't in my account. And I've... I've uh, you know, and a, a month or two months went by and I kept phoning up personnel at finance saying, where's my superannuation? And they kept saying, oh, look, it's coming, it's coming. I didn't know it at the time. I found out when I went back three years later to look at my files that Galloway was trying to, to seize my superannuation payout. He was writing letters to Agrabo, Australian Government Retirement Benefits Office, which ran the super scheme, which ran the the Commonwealth Super Scheme, say, uh, saying that I was not entitled to the money 
that I wasn't deserving of it because of my conduct. And Galloway had to sign the authorisation form to, to release my money, and he was refusing to sign the form. And there was correspondence backwards and forwards. I mean, Galloway had no right to do that. That was my money. You know, I earned that money, and it was put aside for me for the day I, I left the department. You know, he had no power over that money, no right to try and stop that money being paid out. And, you know, letters went backwards and forwards and personnel were told that if the assistant secretary, which is Galloway, refused to sign the form, that they could get the, they could go over his head, that they could get the deputy secretary or the secretary of the department to sign it. So, you know, they, they made up a note and sent it that and the form to the Deputy Secretary, and the Deputy Secretary signed the form, and my money came through. I got my, my superannuation payout, and I went to the credit union, and I paid off my loan, you know, and, and that was it. You know, I no longer had that burden over my head. And, and it didn't end there. I mean, I started at the CCAE, Canberra University, and again, like I said, post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, I just, trying to get over the past eight years of, of just, I was virtually punch drunk when I left finance. I was completely burnt out, almost punch drunk at just being, being bashed around the head for eight years with this, this relentless campaign at finance. And it took me years to get over it. In fact, even today, 30 or, 30 or so years later, I still get flashbacks about it. I'm still suffering post-traumatic stress disorder over it. I mean, um, the scars run really deep, the psychological scars of, of, of those eight years. And, and I really couldn't sort of function there. I, I had a lot of trouble there at, at the uni. And then what happened in August that year Galloway got back at me again because Galloway and the rest of them at finance found out that I was at uni. And so Galloway thought, oh, you know, I'll get back at him. We'll bring in tertiary fees. You know, because up until then, tertiary education had been free. You know, I had all these plans to do a communications course and then a postgraduate course in sports science and all of that. And Galloway got on got contacted Treasury in the pre-budget deliberations and they put forward a, a scheme to bring back tertiary fees. It started off with an administrative charge of about $300 for the first couple of years and then in early 1988 they brought back full tertiary fees in the form of the HEX scheme or the graduate tax as it was called then, $25,000 for a course that debt would be put onto you and would hang over your head for the rest of your life until you paid it off. You know, and I thought, stuff that. I mean, it was bad enough having a debt for about $4,000 or $5,000 when I was at finance, but to have $25,000, and then if I went ahead and did that postgraduate course in sports science, that would be another $25,000 I'd, I'd have a $50,000 debt hanging over me. I mean, it, it'd be like if I went out and bought a Mercedes and got a loan to buy a Mercedes and had to pay off the, that loan for $50,000. And, you know, in 1988, when, early 1988, when they brought in that graduate tax, I said, stuff this, and I pulled out of uni. You know, I got a deferral at the end of 1986 because I didn't do well in the exams because of, you know, all of the, the aftermath of finance. And so um, I got a deferral for 1987. And again, during 1987, Galloway got back at me again because I was going, I went on the dole and I went for job interviews and that and not getting anything. And I went to the CES, the Commonwealth Employment Service, to the, my case manager there asking, you know, what's going on? And he said to me, he said, oh, you know, we get... We're getting all these reports from employers that they're contacting finance and someone someone there is bagging the hell out of you saying, telling the employers not to employ you. And I knew exactly who it was. It was Galloway. 
So I wrote a letter to Galloway saying, saying, if you badmouth me again to any future employer, I am going to sue you for defamation and I'm going to see about suing you for, for loss of income. And that didn't stop it. He kept on doing it. And then in 1988, when I went back to finance to see my files, he tried to stop me entering the building. You know, I'd arranged it with personnel a week before to come in, and they said, it's all right, come in at the particular, on the particular day and time. And when I got to the security desk, I was told that Mr Galloway had said that I was not to enter the building. You know, it was three years later. I wasn't a threat to him anymore, but no. You know, and I screamed and yelled, and I was... Someone from personnel came down and let me go in and look at my files. There were about seven or eight files. And I did that over three days. And after the first day, because I went in there with a clipboard and pen and was taking notes, there was a thing on the front page of the Canberra Times saying that the government was reforming the ComCare laws, the public service compensation scheme, so that I would be ineligible to claim under it. You know, they thought that I was going in there taking notes from my files, trying to prepare a legal case against them. And I thought, more legislation aimed at me. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And then after that, two years after that, when I was at Department of Defence, Galloway sent a report over to the Department of Defence, bagging me out, you know, detailing all of the charges against me, saying that my conduct was unsatisfactory. And that effectively sabotaged my job there at Department of Defence. That was on my file there. And, oh, you know, and, and look, I'm, I'm convinced. I, I can't understand why Galloway had this obsession about getting back at me. You know, it was one thing to force me to resign from the, the department, but to just continue that on for years after. I mean, I'm, sh I'm convinced that he wanted to see me commit suicide. He was trying to push me over the edge and, and commit suicide. I mean, he's probably still plotting against me. You know, if he's still alive, that is. I, I don't know. I don't know whether he's still alive or not or what became of him. He's probably still there working in finance. Oh, you know, but this this monomania, this obsession with getting back at me. But anyway, um, this is about to come to an end. These videos are coming to an end. And I, I did get temporary jobs in the public service after that, you know, one two months work here, three months work there and, and everything like that. But, you know, like I said before, I'm still suffering the effects of those eight years at Department of Finance that, that I'll never be able to get over it. And I just hope that in the 30 years since then that things have improved, that, that nobody would be subjected to what I had to put up with at Department of Finance again. I hope that things have improved. But knowing the public service culture that I, that I encountered there, I really do doubt whether anything much has improved. I mean, there's a lot more um, recognition of workplace bullying nowadays, that people recognise that it is a problem and that there are mechanisms in there to deal with, com with complaints about it now. But, you know, I, I just hope that things have improved since when I was at Department of Finance and I, I had to suffer all, all of this this terrible business. Anyway, this this video series is about to is about to end now. Um, I hope you've found it educational and enlightening, and I hope it's given you an insight into bullying in the public service and how how it almost destroyed my life. And I I just hope that um, if you come across this sort of thing, that you're able to deal with it better than I was able to deal with it. Anyway, um, like I said, this series is, a, uh, is about to end now. I hope you've, you've gained an insight into workplace bullying and the workplace culture out of it. And I hope to, to see you again sometime down the line in the future with future YouTube videos. And I hope you found this, this series to be enlightening and educational. Okay? Thank you for listening. All the best. Goodbye. And, and here's to a better future in the workplace for everybody. Goodbye.